Christian and life is uh, that does not fall in that fashion. Parties represent basically class interests, uh, or largely classes so. would not exist, in and classes would have been eliminated or transcended in, in such a society. One last question on the political organization: Is there not a danger that with this sort of hierarchical tier of uh, uh, assemblies and quasi-governmental structure, without direct elections, that the uh, the central body or the body that is in some sense at the top of this uh, pyramid gets very remote from the people uh, on the ground, and since it will have to have some power, so it's going to deal with international affairs, for example, deal with other countries, and may even have to mm. have control over armed forces and things like that, that it would be less democratically responsive than the existing regime. Well, first of all, there would be direct uh, elections under any, except the direct elections would be at every one of these levels. That is, uh, as far as the lowest level is concerned. They, the, le the next level, the next level would then elect no, the level above that. Now, the question is, I, uh, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, property of any uh, libertarian society will be to prevent an evolution in the direction that you've mm. described, which is a possible evolution, and one that institutions should be designed to abort, to prevent. And I think that that's entirely possible. I mean, I'm myself, I'm totally unpersuaded that the uh, Participation in governance is a full-time job. I don't think it is. Uh, it may be in, in an irrational society where there are uh, uh, all sorts of problems that arise because of the uh, irrational nature of institutions. But in, in a properly functioning uh, advanced industrial society organized along libertarian lines, I would think that executing decisions taken by representative bodies uh, is a part-time job which should be rotated throughout the community, and furthermore should be undertaken by people who are at all times, uh, continue to be participants in their own direct uh, activity. Now, it may be, it's possible, that uh, it is necessary to have, uh, it, it, that, that governance is itself uh, a function on a par with, say, steel production. If that turns out to be true, and I think that's a question of empirical fact that has to be determined, can't be projected out of the mind, but if it turns out to be true, then it seems to me the natural suggestion is that governance should be organized industrially as simply another branch of industry. That is, the uh, civil servants or others who are involved in this form of activity, taking it to be, by hypothesis now, uh, a meaningful and useful form of activity, uh, that they themselves should be organized as simply one of the branches of industry with their own w workers' councils and their own self-governance and their own participation in broader assemblies. Uh, now, that's, uh, I might say that in the spontaneous development of workers' councils that has occasionally appeared here and there in the world, well, for example, the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, that's pretty much what happened. There was, as I recall, a workers' council of state employees, I uh, forget what they call themselves, civil servants or something like that, who were simply organized along industrial lines as another branch of industry. That's perfectly possible. And it should be, or it could be, a, a barrier against the creation of a, the kind of remote coercive bureaucracy that anarchists, of course, fear. Mr. Zomsky, I think that might be a convenient place to interrupt ourselves in a moment. I'd like to come back and press you a little further on how that would work out, for example, in relation to uh, the control of the Pentagon and the defense organization in uh, societies, if there could be any. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Part one, I've been talking to Professor Noam Chomsky of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology about libertarian socialism or anarchism as a political theory and as a possible alternative to our existing liberal democracies. And towards the end, he was describing the political constitution of an anarchist society. Professor Chomsky, I'd like to press you a little bit further about the way in which uh, effective democratic control would be achieved consistently with uh, discharging the necessary functions of society. If you suppose that... Uh, there would continue to be a need for self-defense um, on quite a sophisticated level. Mm. Um, I don't quite see from your description how you would achieve effective control by the system of part-time uh, representative uh, councils at various levels from the bottom up over an organization as, as powerful and uh, as necessarily technically sophisticated as, for example, the Pentagon, which is a body with which you've had a, had a long record of mm -hmm. conflict over the Vietnam War and other matters in uh, recent years. Can you describe how uh, the uh, Pentagon exactly. could, at uh, one at the same time, be efficient as a defense organization and nonetheless properly responsive to democratic control within the United States if it wasn't an anarchist society? Well, first we should be a little clear, clear about terminology. 
You refer to the Pentagon as is usually done as a defense organization. And in fact, uh, I remember very well in 1947 when the uh, National Defense Act was passed that established the uh, current system of war making, uh, the former War Department, the, the American Department uh, concerned with war at that period, up to that time, was the Army honestly yeah. the War Department, yeah. and it had branches. And its name was changed in that act to the Defense Department. And any sophisticated uh, person, and I don't, I was a student then and didn't think I was very sophisticated, but I knew and everyone knew that this meant that to whatever extent that the American military had been involved in defense in the past, and partially it had been, so this was now over. Since it was being called the Defense Department, that meant it was going to be a Department of Aggression, nothing oh, else. The principle of never and, believe anything because it's officially denied. Them. Right, sort of uh, on the assumption that Orwell essentially had captured the nature of the modern state. Uh, and that's exactly the case. I mean, the Pentagon is in no sense a Defense Department. It's not, it has never defended the United States from anyone. It has only served to uh, conduct aggression. Uh, and uh, I think that the American people would be much better off without a Pentagon. I don't, they certainly don't need it for defense. I think its intervention in, inter in international affairs has never been, well, you know, never is a strong word, but I think you, can, you would be hard put to find a case, certainly it has not been its characteristic uh, pose to support uh, freedom or liberty or uh, to defend people uh, uh, and, and so on. That's not the role of the, of the massive uh, military organization that is controlled by the Defense Department. Rather, it's its tasks are, are two, both quite antisocial. Uh, the first is to uh, preserve an international system in which what are called American interests, which primarily means business interests, can flourish. And secondly, uh, it has an internal economic task. I mean, the Pentagon has been the primary Keynesian mechanism whereby uh, the government intervenes to uh, maintain what is ludicrously called the health of the economy by, uh, by its... Uh, by uh, inducing production, that means production of waste. Now, both of those, uh, both of those functions serve certain interests. In fact, dominant interests, class and predominant class interests in American society. But I uh, don't think that they, in any sense, serve the the public interest. And I would think that uh, that this system of uh, production of waste and of destruction would essentially be dismantled in a libertarian society. Now, one shouldn't be too glib about this. If, let's say, a, uh, well, if one can imagine, let's say, a social revolution in the United States, that's rather distant, I would assume, but if that took place, it's hard to imagine that there would be any uh, credible enemy from the outside that could threaten that social revolution. Uh, we wouldn't be attacked by Mexico or uh, you know, uh, Hawaii or something like that. Uh, well, it's part of the United States, Cuba, let's say. Uh, the, the, uh, an American revolution would be uh, would, would not require, I think, defense against aggression. On the other hand, if a libertarian social revolution were to take place, say, in Western Europe, then I think the problem of defense would be very critical. I was going to say, I mean, it, it cannot surely be inherent to the anarchist idea that there should be no self-defense, because such anarchist experiments as there have been have, on the record, actually been destroyed from... No, it certainly is not, yeah. Uh, but let, I think that these questions have to be, cannot be given a general answer. They have to be answered specifically relative to specific, or specific uh, histor historical and objective conditions. Yeah, it's just that I find a little difficulty in following, before the break, your description of uh, the proper democratic control right. of this kind of an organization on the basis that the defense organization itself would become some kind of uh, workers' cooperative. And I wouldn't because say that. I find it a little hard to see no, the generals no. controlling themselves in right. a manner which you would approve of. Well, that's why I, 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 I do want to point out the complexity of the issue. It depends on the country and the society and, uh, that we're talking about. In the United States, one kind of problem arises. If there were a libertarian social revolution in Europe, then I think the problems you raise would be very serious because there would be a, a serious problem of defense. That is, I would assume that if libertarian socialism were achieved at some level in Western Europe, there would be a direct military threat, both from the Soviet Union and from the United States. And the problem would be how that should be countered. Uh, that's the problem that was faced by the Spanish Revolution. There, there was direct military intervention by, uh, well, really three-pronged, by fascists, by communists, and by the liberal democracies uh, in the background. And the question how one can defend oneself against the pack at this level is a very serious one. Uh, however, I think uh, we have to raise the question whether centralized standing armies uh, with uh, uh, high-technology deterrence are the most effective way to do that. And that's by no means obvious. Uh, for example, I don't think that a Western European 
centralized army would itself deter, say, Russian-American attack to prevent libertarian socialism, the kind of attack that I would quite 